my pleasure now to introduce our second speaker. David Horner is an emeritus, 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 emeritus <laughs> professor of Australian Defence History at the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre at the Australian National University. His research interests include Australian defence history, particularly strategy, command, intelligence and operations and current defence issues. He is the official historian for the Australian Peacekeeping and Post-Cold War Operations series. And Professor Horner will now consider the era from the interwar period to the Cold War. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much for that introduction. It's a great joy to be back in Melbourne and to see some old friends uh, here as well. And this painting of, of the bombing of Darwin in February 1942 is a reminder of the outcome if defence policy proves faulty. In the 30 years between 1919 and 1949, Australian defence policy and strategy went through several major changes that ultimately resulted in a force structure that was to last for a further 30 years. During this time, there were four major phases of defence policy development. And the first, obviously, beginning in 1919, was the era of the Singapore strategy. Button did you push there? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be your slide first. Well, okay, all right. This, this. Yeah. The mouse didn't seem to work. Yeah. We're on the right slide, but I So, what do I do? Press. No, okay. All right, let's see if that happens. <laughs> I did press the machine, it just didn't happen. Now the end of the First World War presented Australian defence planners with a new set of challenges, or more accurately, the old challenges in a new context. Australia still saw its security in terms of imperial defence, but Australia and Britain had been weakened by the war. In some ways, the huge and expensive contribution to the First World War with the deployment of some 300,000 soldiers to the Middle East and Europe was an aberration. After the war, Australian defence planners reverted to their pre-war concerns when they had identified Japan as a threat. Pressed it, nothing happened. <laughs> Just give you a nod, Laura. Right. I am pressing it. There's nothing happening. And many Australians, both the public, the public and policy makers, feared the yellow peril. And earlier the government had introduced, as we heard earlier, the notorious white Australian policy to keep Asians out. And after the war, the League of Nations gave Japan responsibility for the former German islands north of the equator while Australia retained control of northeast New Guinea that had been captured from Germany in the war. In these distant waters, Japan and Australia were now neighbours. Next one. The Japanese threat was confirmed <coughs> by Britain's Admiral of the Fleet, Lord Jellicoe, when he visited Australia in 1919 to report on naval defence. Jellicoe concluded that when Britain was involved in conflict in Europe, Japan might seize the Netherlands, East Indies, and New Guinea and invade Australia. With this threat in mind, in 1920, senior Australian Army generals recommended that the government provide a substantial naval force to help Britain's Royal Navy defend its possessions in the Far East. They also recommended building up Australia's part-time militia to a force of two cavalry divisions and the equivalent of five infantry divisions. 
but constrained by the Defence Act, this force could not serve outside Australia and its planning centred on the defence of the continent. After the tragic losses of the First World War, the Australian public was understandably weary of war, and many people believed that it was no longer necessary to keep large forces ready for another conflict. Scarce finances, they thought, should be used for national development, and successive governments sought ways to reduce expenditure on defence. As part of the international effort to prevent conflict, at a naval conference in Washington in 1921, Britain, the United States and Japan agreed to limit their naval forces. Under the treaty, Australia's naval vessels were included as part of the Royal Navy, and as a result, the old battle cruiser HMS, HMAS Australia was scuttled off Sydney heads. Although the Conservative National Party government agreed to build up the militia, it failed to provide the necessary funds and the scheme for compulsory military service was watered down. The military chiefs had hoped that the militia would have a strength of 270,000 soldiers in time of war. But by 1922, it numbered just 37,000. It was impossible to conduct realistic training in units that often existed in name only. As one historian put it, Defence lay defenceless before the political onslaught. The dilemma was how to defend a small, economically weak, remote country against an enemy such as Japan. The solution was to seek security within the empire. At an imperial conference in London in 1923, Britain proposed building a naval base at Singapore to which it would send its main fleet in time to deter the Japanese fleet. Now, there were several problems with this scheme, known as the Singapore strategy. It was unlikely that Japan would strike unless Britain were preoccupied in Europe. And in that case, Britain might not be able to spare its fleet to go to Singapore. This is indeed what happened in 1941-1942. Another problem was defending the Singapore base until the main fleet arrived. The Australian government's blind optimism about the strategy was demonstrated by Prime Minister Stanley Bruce's comments at the London conference. And he's the one there with the, with the stats, as I mentioned. <laughs> he said, while I'm not quite as clear as I should be as to how the protection of Singapore is to be assured, I'm clear on this point. Apparently it can be done. <laughs> the, falseness, the falseness of this hope was to be similarly demonstrated in 1942. Under the Singapore strategy, Australia built up its navy, but the army was required merely to deal with small-scale raids against the Australian man of mainland and was starved of funds. Australian Navy <coughs> generals did not agree with this strategy, but the Royal Australian Navy's leaders supported it. When presented with conflicting views, the Australian government sought advice from Britain, which naturally advocated the Singapore strategy. The Labor government was elected in 1929, and in accordance with the Labor Party policy, immediately suspended compulsory military service. The army strength fell from 47,000 to 27,000. And soon the economic effects of the Great Depression were being felt. Some Navy ships were scrapped. In January 1932, the newly formed United Australia Party came to power with Joseph Lyons as Prime Minister. But while it was anxious to build up the forces, it was constrained by lack of funds. It was not long before Japan's expansionist policies were evident. In 1931, it seized... Not the next one. In 1931, it seized Manchuria. In 1933, it left the League of Nations. And in 1937, it began a war against China. In Europe, Germany under Adolf Hitler was displaying evidence of similar intentions. Constrained by lack of money and by the difficulty of purchasing <coughs> armaments overseas, the Australian government belatedly tried to build up its forces. Next one, please. Relying on the Singapore strategy, it concentrated on building the Navy. 
which by mid-1939 had a strength of about 5,500 permanent officers and sailors. The Navy consisted of two heavy cruisers, three modern light cruisers, one old light cruiser, five old destroyers, one loan from the Royal Navy, and two sloops. It was a small but capable force. As the Defence Act did not allow for a large regular army, the government sought to boost the part-time militia. And by March 1939, it had a strength of 70,000. It was poorly trained and equipped, lacking tanks and modern artillery. The regular army was pathetically small, fewer than 4,000 in number. By mid-1939, the RAAF had 12 squadrons and a regular and citizen force strength of 3,600 personnel. Its newest aircraft were already obsolescent. More modern aircraft were on order, but even the best, the Wirraway, was only a trainer, not a modern fighter. Some historians have claimed that with a weak and faltering economy, the government had no option but to rely on Britain and the Singapore strategy. To its credit, in the late 1930s, the government started to manufacture munitions, but the permanent officers and soldiers felt badly treated by successive governments, and there is little evidence of clear thinking by government ministers. Well, the next phase in the development of Australian defence policy began with the outbreak of the Second World War in 1939. In the first three months of the war, the Australian government made two crucial decisions, namely to commit Australia to involvement in the Empire Air Training Scheme and to deploy the Second Australian Imperial Force, the Second AIF, overseas. These decisions were to have far-reaching consequences for the future shape of the nation's war effort. As a result of the Empire Air Training Scheme, for the next two years, the major effort of the Royal Australian Air Force was devoted to training air crew in Australia and overseas before they joined squadrons in the United Kingdom. Later, when Australia was under threat of attack, the RAAF in Australia expanded and operations were conducted from Australia. But even then, large numbers of air crew were sent to Britain where the RAAF squadrons operated as part of British air formations. Vast resources were spent on operations over which Australia had no control or so. <coughs> the decision to deploy the second AIF was perhaps more important. Critics have claimed that Prime Minister Robert Menzies was so anxious to please Britain that he sent forces overseas even though it exposed Australia to risk. In fact, because of fear of Japan, he was reluctant to send the AIF overseas. And it was only after an assurance from Britain that it would defend Australia if a threat arose that Menzies finally agreed to dispatch the force. And the first troops sailed to the Middle East in January 1940. Eventually, four divisions went overseas, three to the Middle East, where they took part in major campaigns that determined the outcome of the war in that area. Whether these deployments denuded Australia's defences and made Australia more vulnerable to attack, or whether they were justified because they helped save the British position in the Middle East and provided valuable battle chain units for the later defence of Australia, is one of the great questions of Australian military history. If Germany had defeated Britain at this time, Japan would have had a free hand in the Far East. For this reason, Australian ships were sent from Australian waters to join British naval forces in the Middle East. But naval forces could be moved back to Australia relatively quickly if the need arose. The army units could not be moved quickly at all. Germany's defeat of France gave Japan an opportunity in the Pacific. And in September 1940, its troops marched into northern French Indochina. The next month, a conference of representatives from Britain, Australia, New Zealand, the United States and the Netherlands, held in Singapore, expressed concerns about Japanese intentions and the security of Singapore. As a result, Australia decided to send a brigade from the 8th uh, Division, an AIF division, to Malaya 
to help defend Singapore, <coughs> and it arrived in February 1941. Also, the War Cabinet sent Menzies to London to seek reinforcements for Malaya. Arriving in London in February 1941, Menzies took part in the decision to send troops to Greece, but was unable to persuade Churchill to send substantial forces to Malaya. Meanwhile, in February 1941, British and American military leaders meeting in Washington agreed that in the event of war with Japan, they would fight a holding war in the Pacific and concentrate their forces to defeat Germany. The Australian government was not consulted, but when it learned about this beat hit the first strategy, it was shocked. The acting Prime Minister, Arthur Fadden, wrote later, if Australia were to be abandoned by these two great powers until the war in Europe was decided, we and our countrymen might well be pulling rickshaws before long. On the 14th of February, 1941, the Australian Chiefs of Staff met the War Cabinet and the Advisory War Council to consider the growing Japanese threat. The Chiefs advised that Australia's area of responsibility should include Timor, Ambon, New Guinea, and Nauru, and that the 8th Division should be retained for use in the Australian area and the Far East, rather than deploying it to the Middle East. In accepting these recommendations, the Cabinet endorsed a major change in Australia's strategic focus. Australia's defence was now linked closely with the region. Over the next few months, small numbers of troops all that was available were deployed across the near region. An AIF battalion and support troops went to Rabaul in New Britain. A militia battalion went to Port Moresby. And independent companies went to New Ireland and New Caledonia. A brigade of the 8th Division went to Darwin, from which battalions could be deployed to Ambon and Timor as soon as the Netherlands authorities agreed. The remaining brigade of the 8th Division went to Malaya bringing the 8th Division there to a strength of two brigades. Twelve months before the surrender of Singapore, Australia's pre-war defence policy was relying on a British fleet stationed at Singapore had been revealed as totally inadequate. Furthermore, it was no longer sufficient to defend the Australian continent by deploying forces within Australia. The approaches needed to be secured. And even if the islands were merely to become bases for observation aircraft, the army needed to protect them. By sending forces to the Middle East and Europe in support of the Imperial Defence, Australia reduced its capacity to deploy forces to the region in defence of Australia. In retrospect, Australia could have fully mobilised its militia in early 1941, rather than waiting until the outbreak of war with Japan. Even then, however, Australia had insufficient naval and air forces to support units deployed to the region. Well, the next phase in the development of Australian defence policy began in December 1941. The outbreak of the Pacific War on the 7th and 8th of December 1941 brought to reality the threat that had concerned Australian defence planners from the beginning of the century, namely the possibility of invasion by Japan. Initially, Australian military leaders could do little, could do little more than continue their policy of deploying small numbers of troops to the islands to the north of Australia. <coughs> These included deploying battalions to Ambon, Ambon and Timor, and an independent company to Portuguese Timor. Along with the brigade-sized formation from the 7th Division that went to Java. All these units became hostages to fortune. Within a few months, all of them, including the 8th Division in Malaya, had gone into grim captivity. The only exceptions were the independent company in Portuguese Timor and the troops in Papua. The fall of Singapore on the 15th of February 1942 marked the end of the Singapore strategy. The Labour government, led by John <coughs> Curtin, realised that Britain was unable to assist and that Australian security would rest on the United States, particularly its Pacific fleet. In the meantime, Curtin insisted that the 6th and 7th Divisions sailing from the Middle East to the Far East be returned to Australia 
rather than be diverted to Burma, where they would almost certainly have been captured. Australian naval forces returned to Australian waters, but the RWF units in Britain remained there for the rest of the war. The reliance on the United States was brought home when the American General Douglas MacArthur was appointed Commander-in-Chief of the Southwest Pacific Area. This was an Allied command based in Australia. MacArthur commanded all the Australian, American and Dutch forces in the Australian area. In effect, Curtin gave up an element of Australian sovereignty, putting the defence of Australia in the hands of a foreign general who reported to Washington, not Canberra. In the circumstances, perhaps Australia had no other option. Australia had little capacity to influence Allied strategy that was determined by US President Franklin Roosevelt and British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. MacArthur and Curtin jointly sought to persuade Roosevelt and Churchill to send additional military resources to Australia. Fortunately for Australia, the United States wanted to preserve Australia as a base for the counter-offensive against Japan. The best that Australia could do was to expand its forces to the greatest extent possible and mobilise Australian industry to arm and maintain those forces. The US Navy rested the initiative on the Japanese in the battles of the Coral Sea and Midway. And in the second half of 1942, Australian and American forces under MacArthur's command halted the Japanese advance in Papua and then began a counter-offensive that recovered the north coast of Australia and New Guinea during 1943 and early 1944. For more than a year, the Australian government went along with the American direction of the war without dissent. But by mid-1943, the government realised that it did not have sufficient manpower to undertake all the tasks to which it was committed. On the 1st of October, 1943, the Cabinet decided that by June 1944, the services should release 20,000 men and fix the monthly intake into the services of 5,000 men and women. But the War Cabinet did not wish to reduce its fighting force in the Pacific substantially, as it believed Australia should maintain forces large enough to take part in operations that would guarantee Australia an effective voice in the peace settlement. These decisions were fundamental to the balance of Australia's war effort for the remainder of the war. By 1945, the Army had shrunk to six divisions, but all of them were in action in the Pacific. If Australian troops had stopped fighting, it would have made little difference to the outcome of the war. But Australian forces needed to remain in action to strengthen the alliance with the United States and Britain in the post-war world. The echoes of this policy can be found in the reasons for committing Australian forces for overseas military operations over the following 75 years. Well, the next phase in the development of Australian defence policy actually began before the end of the war. In January 1944, <laughs> Australia and New Zealand signed an agreement known as the Canberra Pact. It wasn't a military alliance. Its focus was on working together on matters of mutual interest. Of particular concern was the post-war fate of the Pacific Islands captured by American forces. Australia and New Zealand agreed that after the war, Australia should be the predominant influence over New Guinea, Timor, the Netherlands East Indies, the Solomons, New Hebrides and Malaya. Australia would no longer rely passively on British support. At the Commonwealth Prime Minister's Conference in London in May 1944, Curtin sought to strengthen Commonwealth defence cooperation in the Pacific to balance the influence of the United States. After the war, the government, now led by Ben Chifley, and its military advisers concluded that the nation's security was derived principally from its geographic location. But because of its limited industrial and economic capacity, Australia had to rely on allied support. Therefore, Australia's defence forces had to be structured so that they could cooperate with British Commonwealth forces, particularly in the Pacific. 
1946, the Chief of Staff saw the Soviet Union as a possible enemy. But the Minister for External Affairs, Bert Ebert, uh, Bert Ebert, did not want to paint the Soviet Union as an enemy. He placed his faith in the newly formed United Nations, and the government was reluctant to recognise that Australia might be involved in the developing Cold War. On the 4th of June, 1947, the government announced Australia's first <coughs> post-war defence policy and stated that Australia needed to be able to provide forces that firstly could be placed at the disposal of the United Nations for the maintenance of international peace and security, including regional arrangements in the Pacific. That secondly, could provide for cooperation in British Commonwealth defence. And thirdly, could provide for the inherent right of self-defence. Now, since the United Nations uh, concept was undefined, and the United States was reluctant to commit itself in the Pacific, Commonwealth defence and self-defence were the chief determinants of Australia's military force structure. But despite these high ideals, the overriding determinant was finance. The government simply decided defence would be allocated a specific sum of money over the next five years, and the services had to do the best they could with that money. Now generally, the Navy was composed of ships left over from the Second World War, and its main units were to be four cruisers and six destroyers, with a cruiser and two destroyers in reserve. The most significant development was the decision to acquire a fleet air arm of two aircraft carriers to enable the Navy to play its role in cooperating with Allied navies and in keeping open the sea lines of communication. Like the Navy, the Air Force relied on Second World War aircraft with plans to obtain the Lincoln bomber and the Vampire fighter. And the Air Force was to be, be built around three heavy bomber squadrons, six fighter squadrons, two reconnaissance squadrons, and two transport squadrons. The defence policy allowed for two significant army developments. The first was the formation of the Australian Regular Army. A regular brigade group was to be formed based on the brigade in the British Commonwealth Occupation Force in Japan. But at this stage, the new regular army struggled to staff these three battalions. The brigade was to provide a base for expansion in time of war. The second significant development was the raising of the citizen <coughs> the CMF. As it was to be filled by volunteers, its organisation was rather ambitious, even if it was smaller than the pre-war militia. Equipment was available. It was left over from the Second World War. There were vague plans that in the event of war, the Australian Army would provide forces for the Middle East where armoured units would be required. Although there was the problem that the CMF could not serve overseas. This general force structure for all three services was to continue thereabouts for the next 30 years. The government was now clearly focused on its defence of the region. In March 1948, an insurgency began in Malaya, and in May 1948, Australia, Britain and New Zealand agreed to begin military planning for the sea and air defence of the Malaya region. This was the beginning of the ANZAM, the Australia, New Zealand and Malaya Agreement. Australia's commitment to ANZAM brought with it a sharpened sense of place in Southeast Asia and a policy of concentrating defence efforts in the neighbourhood. But except for the occupation force in Japan, which was soon to end, the government did not envisage basing or even deploying forces outside Australia. The government had learned several lessons from the Second World War. Australian security was best achieved by cooperation with allies especially within the British Commonwealth. Cooperation with the United States would be ideal, and at this stage it was elusive. However, Australia would not always be able to rely on allies in the near region, and therefore needed small, capable forces of its own. By 1949, the Chifley government had not fully come to terms with the demands of the Cold War, which was becoming more intense as the Communists seized power in China. But this was the situation facing the 
Menzies coalition government that was elected in 1949. <coughs> Australian defence policy would need to change yet again. We'll hear more from that in the next presentation. Thank you very much. <coughs> Interesting is uh, when MacArthur first came to Australia out of uh, the Philippines, he made a statement that uh, Australia would be defended by America as long as it was in America's best interest. Is that still true today? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I'm just going up. I was talking about this period, uh, uh, but uh, um, that, that old, old um, uh, saying that uh, uh, no permanent friends only per uh, 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 and. Um, only permanent interests, and uh, uh, that I think has always been the case. That uh, countries that uh, whatever, whatever agreements they've signed have always act in their own best interest when the time comes. Could you just elaborate on how much warning we had from identifying Japan as a potential threat <coughs> to when that threat actually was realised? Well, uh, it depends what you, you, you term the, the identifying Japan as a potential threat, because uh, from the time of the um, Japanese-Chinese War, the Sino-Japanese War, just before the end of the, the 19th century, as Japan was seen to be, to be gaining in power, uh, Australian um, politicians, some of them, uh, and Australian military leaders started to see Japan as a potential threat even back then. And there was a tension there between the views of, of Australian politicians, the human one, and others, who, who have deacon another one, who see Japan as a threat, and uh, the Imperial uh, headquarters in London who, who did not see it that way. So uh, we, we in Australia, many in Australia had seen Japan as a threat the whole way through. And if you look at some of the in intelligence uh, summaries being prepared by uh, senior military officers in the 20s and 1930s, many of them are based around seeing Japan uh, as, as, a, as a threat. Uh, the plans for the defence of Australia in the, in the 1930s were, from an army point of view, were built around what happens if Japan, Japanese land in Newcastle. So that, that was seen not right back then as Japan as, uh, and I mentioned that the Jellico um, uh, report seeing Japan as a threat. Uh, the problem was that uh, it's a small country, only seven million people by, by the time of the Second World War, a small, weak economy, uh, damaged by the depression. What could Australia do other than see its defence in the imperial framework that is in Britain. Uh, and so uh, we were dealing there with a country with Britain that didn't see Japan as a threat in the same way that Australia did. So can I just expand that? Did the Australian people identify that as well? It was just with the experts in the government. Oh, well, I, I, I suppose the best way I'd be putting it would be some Australian people. I mean, this is a, this is a period of oppression. People are trying to, sort of, to, to make a living, uh, uh, trying to keep themselves alive. A uh, huge amount of unemployment. Uh, their focus is not, not on these high strategic, strategic issues. And David, would it be fair to say that in 1945, any perception of threat from Japan evaporated? No, not at all. Oh. Uh, and, <laughs> and Japan had been defeated. Yeah. Uh, but uh, um, Australia wanted to make sure that the, the peace treaty, yeah. uh, the, the final treaty, which was not signed until, until I think 1951, uh, with Japan, and, 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 and uh, uh, make sure that made clear, clear that Japan was going to be kept down. Yeah. And, and what is more, to make sure that Australia has this uh, uh, some sort of treaty with the United States as a protection against. Uh, possible Japanese threat. It was pretty, pretty obvious after a while Japan is not going to be a threat because by the mid 1950s, and people might talk about this, we're, we're um, you know, got trade, trade agreements with them. But 
the, the fact that we defeated in Japan in 1945 didn't mean that they're, that they're immediately seen as on. Well, Professor Horner, it's, it's clear that the Royal Navy was breaking into Japanese traffic on the China station, and the then Lieutenant Nave was a key, <coughs> key person uh, operating on that station in British warships, and uh, that he rose to do other things. But uh, it's evident on any reading of the literature that uh, the Royal Navy was in possession of uh, a lot of intelligence concerning <coughs> Japanese aspirations leading up to its invasion of Manchuria. Um, not sure about the leading up the invasion of Manchuria, but certainly, and I, mean, and I might by that, I was very fortunate many years ago to interview Eric Knave, so, so I knew him. Uh, uh, and breaking of codes is one thing, but anybody who's read anything about this code breaking business will know that it's that's in exact science. You break them for a while, then you don't break them, and so on. Yeah, uh, the, there was plenty of evidence uh, in the 1930s that, that Japan was an expansionist power and they were doing all sorts of things because uh, while there's plenty of evidence that Japan might have been doing a, carrying out reconnaissance um, intelligence gathering in the area uh, of the Pacific, uh, the Japanese army of course had their eyes on other things. The army had their eyes on China and possibly at war with, with the Soviet Union. So it, it's not as, as clear a picture as Japan's building up a capacity um, uh, uh, the Royal Navy should have been aware of it. Uh, remember, of course, that the, the Royal Navy has still got its main focus on, on Europe. <coughs> so, yes, uh, uh, code breaking was going on, showing that Japan is kind of, uh, conducting manoeuvres and what happened in the, in the Pacific. But it was not enough to persuade the Royal Navy, it's just a surprise, I guess, to to persuade the British government that they should do more in the Pacific. Uh, again, there's a mismatch between Australian perceptions and British perceptions. Uh, hi, that's great, Professor Honor. I was just wondering, um, it seems to me that um, since the war, most Australian history and the popular culture has been very um, fixated with Australian campaigns in New Guinea, you know, that being Australian territories and so forth. Um, um, but there's very little uh, talk that goes on about the invasions of Borneo, which, to my mind, see, because we're liberating Dutch and British territory on their behalf, that, you know, politically it would be a more a useful thing for Australia to kind of um, make more of, you know, because it was, a, it, was, it, was a, it was an opportunity where we could show ourselves as a big player, I guess. Oh. Um, why do you think that hasn't happened, or um, am I perhaps overstating the, my perceived importance of it's that? Inter the interesting um, uh, disconnect here, uh, in the in 1944-45 we conducted operations in New Guinea and in Bougainville, New Britain, yes. seen by some as the unnecessary war. Mm -hmm. And so a bit, a bit later, we conducted operations in, uh, in Borneo, Balikpapan, Tarakan, uh, uh, Brunei, and so on. They got a fair run back in the old days because they were AIF divisions. That was nice. You could see you know, the, the, the invasion fleets would come in and they'd be landing and so on. And so they weren't sort of considered part of this unnecessary war? No, and they were not. But I think that was a wrong perception because if we had never gone to Borneo, at all. The war would have, would have made no difference to the, to the outcome of the war. Those unnecessary wars, actually, they were fought in New Guinea and New Britain. The, the, the people have criticised Blaney about that for conducting those, those, those operations. And, he, and, and he, they are only proved in retrospect by the Australian War Company. But I'm paraphrasing here, but let me just paraphrase what Blaney might have said. Blame he might have said, now if the Japanese had captured northern, um, New Guinea, uh, northern um, Queensland or Northern Territory, should we have sat on our hands and waited until the war was over and to get those territories back? No, of course not. Australian Territory, we've got to get back. Oh, well, why don't we want to get back to uh, New Guinea? Is it because they're black? Is it okay because they're black and they've been uh, allowed to be controlled by, by the Japanese? No, Blaney would say. 
That's Australian territory also, and it needs to be recovered. Bougainville, uh, you know, New Britain, uh, New Guinea. Uh, and uh, in that sense, he would argue that they're not unnecessary wars, but it's something that we had to do. So the, the twist there is what was seen as unnecessary wars might not might have been necessary. What is seen as wonderful AIF uh, operations in Borneo, had we not done it, it wouldn't have changed the outcome of the war I, at, at all. Yes, we would we helped to recover some Dutch territory and some British territory. Perhaps there's something to be said there for and um, particularly with the you know, uh, the British area of um, restoring uh, Britain's uh, empire, mm. but it would not have changed the outcome of the war. No, I don't think it, personally I don't think any of those would change the outcome of the war. But it, be it's more just about well, what are the, you know, if you're going to spend treasure and men, what's the most useful way well, to do it for political reasons? No, and I made the point there that, that that decision in October 1943, a crucial decision, <coughs> a decision made there at that point was that the government didn't put it in these terms. If we don't fight anymore, it won't change the outcome of the war. But we do need to fight so that we have a place at the peace trade table, Absolutely. so that we seem to be a, a, a pulling our weight in the alliance. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing, it's a, a political reason for doing it, rather than a reason for close protection of Australia. Mm -hmm. And that is the same driver behind all the Australian military operations that have taken place since 1943, right through to the present time. Yeah. Yeah, thanks very much uh, for a fascinating uh, uh, account, uh, Professor. This is the era of um, the rise of air power and air superiority, and uh, I was wondering, you know, what uh, lessons Australia had uh, learned from that. I mean, the Prince and Wales and Repulse were. were uh, were destroyed just simply because they had no air cover. Uh, the, the Pearl Harbor was a devastation, you know, primarily from air attack, not from naval attack. But they were able to. The Americans were able to, uh, uh, by good luck or whatever, have their their uh, <coughs> their fleet of uh, aircraft carriers at sea, so they were not destroyed, which was an important, hugely uh, important. Thing. What lessons has Australia learned? I mean, you were saying, you know, for the, when you look at the uh, the, the defence, uh, you know, the, the, the role of the Air Force in uh, in that uh, for the 30 years or so after the war, very little changed. I mean, it looks like we never really learned the full lessons of uh, the importance of air power and air superiority. Well, I'm, uh, I'm not sure we, we, uh, we completely understood. I did mention the, uh, the decision to purchase two aircraft carriers, um, which is my, my way of moving air power to the sea. We also decided to, uh, to establish an air force with, which in those days would have seen a balanced air force with some fighters, with some bombers, with some reconnaissance, and so on. The problem that we, we've always had is that uh, we're in the hands of our allies in terms of purchasing the aircraft. And this is the problem that we had in the, in the defence of Australia in the Second World War. That we uh, were always at the end, of, the end of the food chain when it came to getting, getting the aircraft. And, and for that reason, uh, the, the air part of the MacArthur's campaigns were conducted primarily by the, by the Americans with Australian squadrons involved. And we were not in a, in a position until right at the end of the war to have large air forces deployed in the South and the Pacific. Uh, because quite often our aircraft were not as modern as the American American aircraft. Why, so, why didn't we get you know, top flight aircraft? Because, as so, at the end of the food chain, in, in the, 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 before the war, and I'm going to hold them, before, before the Second World War, was the feeling we ought to buy British. Um, when you know, part of the continent that the empire we ought to be buying, buying British. And then uh, some of the airmen started to figure out that, that some of the American aircraft would be better than the British ones. Uh, 
so they were putting orders to buy them from the Americans. But this came at a time when Britain was purchasing aircraft from, from the United States and other countries, and the, and the United States itself was building up its air force in preparation for the time when they joined the war. So that meant that while we put in orders for aircraft, quite often those orders were not put, uh, filled, or if they were filled, uh, filled much later than we, uh, than, 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 uh, we wanted. So that meant that the Australian Air Force was always struggling to be a frontline force in the, in the Pacific because of the fact that they didn't have the best aircraft. Some of them, some of them fine, you know, the, uh, the, uh, uh, some of the, the fighters were, were, were good, but we didn't get the, the top of the range American, American fighters. Uh, and again, after the uh, Second World War, they are starting to have to purchase aircraft, they have to purchase them from overseas. So it, it has been a problem. Uh, and uh, in more recent times, we're talking about the last 30 years, the government has put the bullet and said, well, if we're going to have a top flight air force, we have to spend a lot of money to buy the best aircraft available from the United, <coughs> United States. Uh, there's an old saying that there are, there are two air forces in the world, the United States Air Force and all the others. Um, and so if you want the best aircraft, you're going to buy them. <coughs> so there is, a, is an awareness, awareness there of the importance of air power. Uh, and also, if you think about the campaigns <coughs> in the Pacific, it's, uh, MacArthur uh, really relied very heavily on air power for his advance in the New Guinea. Mm. Yes, it did. Uh, we talk about the army, but in, in effect, the army was used to seize the area to allow him to, MacArthur, to build air, uh, airstrips to fly aircraft off. So, uh, 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 it was a bit, MacArthur's campaign is built very strongly around air power. Professor, as a seasoned historian, I note that you skillfully bypassed the topic of whether Japan had intentions to invade Australia. Oh, yeah, I'll talk about that if you like. But if you like, <laughs> <laughs> because I, mean, I, I received a death threat once because I said that Japan didn't intend to invade Australia. <laughs> I also had an email from a dear old lady up on the Athens Tablelands. And she emailed me and she said, I'm very sorry for you, Professor Horner. You obviously don't know much about military history. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'll tell you that there's a place in Canberra, it's called the Australian War Memorial. <laughs> if you care to go there, you might find something that will help you to understand a bit more about Australian military history. So yes, I've received, so I've received death threats. <laughs> and, 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 and the point is that there was, there was never an agreed plan by Japan to invade Australia. Yes, there are plans, but not an agreed plan. That is, certain elements of the Japan Japanese High Command were looking at plans to invade Australia, but in the, in the period of uh, February, March 1942, Japan had to decide, having captured this area, the code prosperity sphere, what are they going to do next? And after they had all these dis discussions in Tokyo, they decided that what they would do would not be invaders, not to invade Australia, but to cut off Australia from the United States, because the Japanese perceived that Australia would be the base from which, which a counter-offensive would be, be conducted. And therefore, if you can cut Australia off the United States, it would make it much harder to use Australia as the base. Hence, the push down to New Guinea towards uh, Fiji and so on. That's to cut Australia off. Uh, but there was, there was no agreed plan to, to invade Australia. I did notice that for one author said that, that I was wrong. He interviewed a few Japanese private soldiers who were going out to the trail, and he told them that, 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 that they intended to invade Australia. And I'm not sure that those Japanese private soldiers were privy to those decisions. <laughs> and we had a conference a few years ago when we had a um, Japanese scholar come out who'd done a bit of research and, and I, as I recall, and correct me if I'm wrong, from the other members that were there, but he was saying that there was a lot of tension between the Japanese Army and the Navy. Army yes. and Navy. Well, there's, 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 there's tension between the Japanese Army and the Navy, but there's tension within the Navy as well. Mm -hmm. If you can uh, 
uh, there are those elements. That the army, of course, concentrated on, on, on Russia, on, on, on Russia and China. And, 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 uh, and the, the estimate was they need, whatever it was, 12 divisions, and they're not going to pull 12 divisions out of, out of Manchuria. And in any case, they, couldn't, they didn't have ships to carry them to Australia. In, in any case, within the Navy, there were two thoughts. And one thought is the possibility of landing in Australia. The other one is to, uh, to you've got to defeat the United States Navy hence midway and so on. So there are two thoughts within the Japanese Navy. The decision, the decision that was made in Tokyo was not a decision not to invade Australia. It was a decision to put the decision aside for the moment. Which, and they never got back to it. So to all intents and purposes, it's not intended to invade Australia. So, I'll just comment on that one first, if I may. Uh, for the people of Australia, they weren't aware <coughs> that the Japanese weren't intending to invade, so probably anybody living north of uh, the New South Wales-Queensland border was probably terrified that the Japanese were coming down, including that poor lady in the African table then, <laughs> because the Downsville did get bombed, I believe, yes. and quite a few other places up in the north, as well as the uh, bombing of Darwin. With respect to the bombing of Darwin, the saddest thing that occurred there was we had very well trained, very courageous Air Force pilots who went up against the Zeros in boomerangs and, uh, and were always, knowing they were going up to their certain death. It's not a good way to treat well trained pilots to give them inferior equipment. Same thing with people on the ground and the people on the boats. If we expect our defence forces to perform well, we've got to give them the absolute best equipment. <laughs> and, uh, Wasting your life, as as, uh, as, um, as a great uh, armoured commander from the U.S. Army uh, said, he said the aim in war is not to die for your country; it's to make the other bastards die for your country. <laughs> and those are the words he used. Just make the aim in war. Quick point, if I may, about this, this invasion of Australia. I, 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 I should back up a little bit. You, you raised the point about the Japanese Navy and the people in Australia had every reason. In the, in the first six months of 1942 to be afraid of invasion. Uh, the government had every reason, and the military didn't have any information at that time that it was Japan's uh, uh, intention not to invade Australia. So there's every reason to be, to be concerned about the invasion of Australia. Uh, and uh, quite rightly, people who lived there through that period, and remember the Prime Minister Curtin speaking, would be aware of, of, of that. Uh, uh, and it was not until two things that happened. First, we've got Coral Sea and Midway. And secondly, uh, we, we were creating Japanese codes on di in different ways. And, and, and the Americans had cracked their Japanese purple code, which is the diplomatic one. And in reading that diplomatic traffic, they are able to, to read that the Japan did not intend to invade Australia. So the government eventually got that information about the middle of 1942. So from that time on, the government knew that there was no plan to invade Australia. But, you know, it's wartime. Things can change. And I've often said, uh, if the Japanese come over, come over the trail, and they take them, Port Moresby, uh, who knows whether they might have re rethought the whole thing. Uh, so uh, it was a critical period. Uh, and uh, 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 who knows, maybe the, pe the, the commander in, in Port Moresby, Japanese commander, might have said, well, it's not very far across the street. So, so those things could have happened. And so there's every reason for people from that period to, to be concerned about this. And it was a wonderful way to mobilise national will. So oh, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Professor, I think we'd all agree that that Singapore and Malaysia was a strategic disaster for Australian forces. Do you have an opinion on whether it would have been any better if we'd formed a defence line closer to Australia's shores or not? The problem is uh, that this is a difficult period because Netherlands East Indies was Netherlands. And the Netherlands East Indies uh, didn't want to uh, want Australians to go into that area uh, and, and they wouldn't, didn't agree to it until the beginning of the Pacific War. So we could not have gone into, into that area. Secondly, 
to, to, to form a defence line through that area needed air, air and naval power that we did not have in Australia. And there was an effort made, in a way, to do this. The ABDA Command, Australia, British, Dutch, American Command, that was set up with its headquarters in Java, uh, was to do just that. But the forces could not be gathered in time to do it properly. Uh, and they couldn't be coordinated, <laughs> and they, they got ba very badly hammered by the Japanese, both on land, in the air, and at sea, where the Australian, Australian ship, for example, the, 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 the Perth uh, was the sunk. So, uh, it, it was an effort made to do it, and the capability was not there. But I did refer in my, my talk to what I think is a crucial period of life, and that is those decisions of February 1941. For the first time, we're saying, hang on, we're not going to defend Australia by keeping forces within Australia. We're not going to try and defend Australia by just being part of uh, uh, an alliance. We might have to consider what we're going to do ourselves in those islands to the north of Australia. We couldn't do much, but I think that's an important decision-making point uh, for, for policy makers. So I guess um, now looking back, we see World War II and 1941, 42 was a pivotal period where we switched our mindset from having a security alliance with the UK to the US. It wasn't quite that clear cut, was it? Oh, certainly not. No. Uh, 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 it, it was it was an action taken in 1942 in a period of emergency. Yes. But as soon as that emergency passed, with the government, Kirsten government, starting to look back at what can we do from a Commonwealth. Yeah, point, point of view, and that was what Curtin was pushing at the Prime Minister's conference in uh, in London in uh, May 1944, and what they were trying to do with the Zanzan that I, that I mentioned that was established uh, in, in the in the region very soon after the, the Second World War. So uh, uh, the it, 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 you're, you're quite right. It's it's. 1942 is not a point where we, we just change forces completely. Yeah. Okay. Last question. Could I just make a comment? Um, in 1941, we had three prime ministers in three months. So when we talk about um, making decisions about strategic higher issues, <coughs> our politics at home was really very complex. Uh, well, yes, it was. Uh, but there were some saving graces yeah. for, the, for this period. Yes. And the saving grace was the Advisory War Council. Uh, and the, the, what the Advisory War Council was is that it took a small number of key ministers from the government and a small number of, of opposition leaders and put them into the Advisory War Council so that they could consider matters of high strategic policy, not the day-to-day -day running of the war. And so that meant that there is an element of continuity. So that when Curtin became Prime Minister, he had already been considering these issues for about a year. Uh, when uh, Arthur Fadden became Prime Minister, for the, you know, what he wrote in his article called 40 Days and 40 Nights, um, he had been, again, sitting in, in the advisory board the council. So there is an element of continuity. And interestingly, those decisions that I talked about, uh, February 1941 decisions, were made by the Advisory War Council and the War Cabinet uh, when the Prime Minister Menzies was, was overseas. Yes. Uh, so uh, the fact that Menzies was away didn't stop the politicians thinking about these decisions and making, making some decisions. Mm -hmm. Professor Hall, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Ladies and